morning and welcome to worship on this Good Friday. An innocent man has been ruthlessly killed. For whom has this man been sacrificed? For a guilty man, he hung on a cross. For a guilty woman, he has been pierced. What kind of man is this? Who would die in the place of the guilty? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. We have sinned and we've been the cause of Christ's suffering. Please forgive us, we pray. Remove the sins that distance us from you and those we love and care about. Remove from us our thoughtless acts and words that one one another. Remove from us the tendency to hurt others 
out of revenge and anger. Forgive us, please. Create in us a clean heart, O Lord, and renew us in right spirit. Amen. Matthew 27 from verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. On this day, Jesus was mocked and ridiculed. They made a crown of thorns to torment him, to torment the longed for king. Today, we come and recognize that Jesus is the promised king. He is the one worthy of our praise. Our king's journey to the cross was not of his shame, but ours. His gracious act of salvation, the prompt for endless praise. Let's stand and lift our voices in praise to the King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the
Matthew 27, verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled, hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teacher of the law and the elders mocked him, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down, come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him.
to three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge he filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The diadem of pain which sliced your gentle face, three spikes piercing flesh and wood, to hold you in your place. The need for blood, I understand. Your sacrifice, I embrace. But the bitter sponge, the cutting spear, the spit upon your face, did it have to be a cross? Did not a kinder death exist? I'm sorry to ask, but I long to know. Did you do this? for me. You may have heard the saying, build a bridge and get over it. It's a sarcastic comment, meaning that someone should stop worrying or complaining and move on. The trouble is that this bridge building is easily, usually easier said than done. And some problems are very real. And we don't have what it takes to fix them. If someone's struggling with anxiety, depression, anger, addiction or grief, just telling them to get over their problems, that's, that's not going to work. Jesus was a carpenter and he is also the son of God. So he knows all about the problems that we face, including the number one problem that human, humanity cannot fix, no matter how hard we try, and that is sin. Jesus died a horrible death and he built a salvation bridge for you and for me. Today we heard the account of Matthew, who was one of the 12 disciples. Matthew was a tax collector, like Zacchaeus, before Jesus found him. And we know that tax collectors were regarded as sinful scum, Jewish outcasts because they worked for the Romans, the enemy, and got rich by cheating their own people. 
Luke said that Matthew left everything to follow Jesus. Remembering today's Bible readings, imagine how difficult it must have been for Matthew to learn of all this hatred being inflicted on the man who meant so much to him. And I notice that his account doesn't contain many details of the crucifixion itself. Rather, it focuses on the growing torrent of emotional torture. He tells of how they divided his garments by casting lots. They scorned him with a sign, Jesus, King of the Jews. He was actually the king of the universe. They placed him between criminals. Passers-by taunted him. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Can you imagine being so cruel to any dying person, especially someone in so much pain? But it doesn't stop there. The chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, they all joined in. They even suggested that God didn't care about him. He trusts in God. Let God save him now if he wants him. These were the role models, the leaders. Even the criminals on the cross joined in heaping insults. It's the opposite of Palm Sunday when so many people were ready to welcome their king. And all this time, for three hours, Jesus remained completely silent. What was he doing? What was he thinking? Finally, Jesus broke his silence with the striking words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then at three o'clock, darkness came over the land, representing God's judgment on humanity. And Jesus cried out one last time as he gave up his spirit and died. And at that exact moment, the temple curtain tore in two, the earth shook, rocks and tombs cracked open, and the bodies of holy people who had been dead came out alive. Why did he do it? Why did the king of all creation have to suffer such a terrible death? He kept so quiet through the whole ideal ordeal. What was he hoping to achieve? Isaiah 53 was written about 700 years before Jesus for telling the Messiah who had come as a suffering servant. Isaiah wrote, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The similarities between Jesus' death and this suffering servant are undeniable. In verse 7 we read, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shearer is silent. Well, there were probably many reasons why Jesus was silent for three hours of his torture before his death. However, I can't help but notice that when John the Baptist first saw Jesus, he called out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I too recognise the silent lamb, the suffering servant of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 5 says, The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6 puts it like this, There is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the human Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a payment to set all people free. Matthew again points to the removal of this barrier through the tearing of the temple curtain. This mighty veil was made of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and was finely twisted linen. It was created as a barrier between the most holy place and the rest of the temple. 
The Holy of Holies created the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence and the mercy seat and where the sacrifices were made. Only the, whole, the high priest could walk through the curtain once a year on the Day of Atonement, which, by the way, was the day that Jesus died to sprinkle the blood of the atoning sacrifice. And this sacrifice was for the forgiveness of sins for the Jewish people. The curtain was huge, 60 feet tall, 20 feet wide, four inches thick. No one else was allowed in because their sin could not come near to our most holy God. Matthew understood this barrier better than most. He was once considered very sinful. Just spending time with a tax collector could tarnish a good reputation, render one unclean. When Jesus invited Matthew to follow me, the rich man gave up everything because in return, he received the one thing that he lacked, forgiveness, peace with God. We don't have a curtain to remind us, but my sin, your sin, the sin of our world, disrupts the relationship we were meant to enjoy with God. Jesus died to remove the barrier between us and God. But even in some of the most unexpected aspects of this day, we see Jesus building a bridge. In, a passage we, in our passage, we read, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you might think these are the saddest words. The only innocent man who ever lived has been betrayed by one of his closest friends, denied by another, tortured, physically and emotionally by seemingly everyone. <clears throat> Only one of his disciples has dared to stay with him. Has he been abandoned by his father God? Why have you forsaken me? They sound like the words of someone utterly, devastatingly and unjustly abandoned. The worst tragedy. This does not sound like building a bridge rather repelling people away from God. Who would worship a God who forsakes his only son? But I notice something. Jesus calls out in a loud voice, not a weak, defeated one, my God. And he says it twice. And this suggests to me that even now, Jesus knew whose he was. He knew full well that he was his father's beloved son. And Jesus was quoting Psalm 22. He quoted it directly, but he spoke in Aramaic, which was the most common language of that area, so that as many people as possible could hear and understand. This was a well-known Psalm of David. This Psalm depicts a man suffering with faith, the people around would have known all the lines. It foretold the crucifixion. They would have looked around. Like Isaiah 53, they would have noticed the obvious similarities between the psalmist king and Jesus' sufferings. Verses 6 and 7 and 8 foretell Jesus' rejection and the insults. Verses 14 and 15 foretell the pain of crucifixion. Verse 16 foretells the piercings of his hands and feet. These are just some of the prophecies that are, foretell, that are fulfilled. Why did Jesus refer to this psalm in this moment? Because it showed that God was in Christ and in control of the situation. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and that he came for this. The same God who inspired the penning of the 22nd Psalm inspired these words that, that, that indicated exactly what was going on with their king in this moment. From the cross, Jesus was pointing people to what a faith-filled life looks like. 
Psalm 22, 45 says, In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Verses 27 to 31 continued a theme of the king who comes through. He delivers. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. He has done it. Some people take Jesus' quote to be a sign of desperation at his final hour, but this was not true. Jesus' words make it clear that he knew why he had to suffer. It was his mission, and he had confidence that God would deliver him. Psalm 22 is a hymn of faith and victory, and it drew people to him. Following on from Jesus' reference to a victory psalm, here in Matthew's account, before we even reach Sunday, two days before the resurrection, we get a glimpse of Jesus' victory that is on the way. Verse 54 shows how understanding didn't just fall on the Jews who knew the psalm, it also reached the centurion. Because of the way that Jesus suffered, because of the way that he went through his day, maybe it was a look in his eye, or maybe it was a touch of the Holy Spirit, somehow the bridge was extended even to this centurion, and he responded with, surely he was the son of God. This Roman came to a point where he recognized that Jesus is the king. This bridge was drawn for that man to find life. Perhaps the most unusual element of this day also reveals the bridge that Jesus was building. We hear about the dead, being raised. Matthew tells us that when Jesus died, there was an earthquake, the rocks split open, and so did some graves. And out of them, some holy people who had been dead were resurrected. And on Sunday, the day of Jesus' own resurrection, they entered Jerusalem and appeared to many people. How curious. How incredible. It was like the curtain between heaven and earth was torn as well. We get a glimpse of the good future that awaits. Jesus dying on the cross and dealing with sin was opening the way to the better future planned for us. The bodies coming out of the tomb pointed to the fact that Jesus' death would somehow result in restored life for us. His death meant a restoration that would not even death, that death would not even stop. Jesus' death built a bridge for us into the amazing future that he has for us, one that lasts forever. I think of all the cruelty that Jesus endured. He who created the world, he could have walked away. He didn't have to take it on. Jesus could have closed his fist he could, have received to, he could have refused to receive a single nail. But he saw the list that had our name on it. Colossians 2.14 says, He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. It was love that spurred him on. So Jesus himself, he chose the nails. The same hand that stilled the seas, he stills your guilt. The same hand that cleansed the temple, cleanses your heart. The hands that were outstretched became a bridge for you. Removing the barrier to you having a relationship with Father, Son and Holy Spirit, building a bridge for you to enjoy life knowing Jesus as your King, building a bridge to lead you into the good future God has planned for you. I was lost, but Jesus died to build a bridge to bring me home.
Friday we sit in the place where the cost of our sin is exposed but where the abundance of God's grace is on full display. We leave with our hearts full, full of worship and gratitude for our King, our Saviour, who has shown amazing grace to me, to you. Let's stand and lift our voices as we sing, thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid.
And our blessing as we leave this time of worship on Good Friday, would you please declare this for each other? May you leave this place repulsed by sin, but drawn to your Saviour. May you leave amazed at the grace of your King who died for you. May you live in anticipation of the new life of Easter morning. God bless you.